Troll hair, don't care. <laughs> All right. Uh, hey, let's talk about uh, kind of an embarrassing subject for me today in this watch ramble. I'd like to admit my mistakes and talk about the watches that are gone but not forgotten. Watches that I really shouldn't have sold, that I regret moving on from from time to time because I have flipped so many watches over the years of being a watch fan. I like to buy, I like to try, I like to enjoy, and then I mercilessly flip and I move on to the next piece, which I you know, enjoy and try, and then I mercilessly move on to the next piece. And it is a vicious cycle that I, you know, I really do enjoy, but admittedly, I've had some mistakes. I've made some boneheaded moves, and if truth be told, I really should have kept some of them. So I'd like to ramble about that in today's video and, and really admit and, and own up to some of my regrets. Before I jump into those watches, I first would like to invite any of you that live in eastern Pennsylvania or the surrounding states if you're interested in coming out to a meetup, I will be in Lancaster in a little less than two weeks. I'll place all of the details in the description of this video. So stop on by, shoot the breeze, let's talk watches. I will be in town for the NWACC Collectors Convention, and I think that's going to be a lot of fun. So again, if you can make it out, details will be in the description of this video. Now let's get to my first regret. And it is a watch that I would not rebuy in its specific uh, iteration, but I would rebuy a different version of it. And I'm talking about the Omega Seamaster Electric Blue. In my opinion, it is the most dynamic blue dial for a dive watch that I've ever owned. I love how it changes from dark blue to brighter blue, electric blue. I love the classic tiny wave pattern. I love the large loom, the polished bezel. I think it looks fantastic on the uh, Speedmaster style five link bracelet or the Brosnan Bond Seamaster type of bracelet. It is thin. It carries a Faraday shield. Uh, man, it, it just doesn't get much better than that Seamaster. So I wouldn't be interested in the quartz version that I got, but I would be interested in the automatic variation. So my challenge now is to find a good example because so many of these have just been murdered by refinishers trying to polish out any type of blemish. So you lose some of the case edges. You lose definitely some of the text in the clasp and that is, it's just a shame when that happens. So if I can find a good unmolested example, I will snap that up. I will have my certified watchmaker service it and I will enjoy this piece. I will not make the mistake of moving on from it. So hopefully I can find a decent example before they become too difficult to source. Now, another blue dial diver that I regret moving on from is a Seiko. And let me explain this one. This one is the Transocean. It carries a beautiful transitional dial, a full ceramic bezel. It also has an integrated bracelet with a milled clasp, a sapphire crystal inner applied anti-reflective treatment. And it's just a dazzling watch. It really is a classic from Seiko. And I think I only spent maybe $600 used on that piece several years ago now. And you just can't find value like this anymore. If you want a Seiko diver with all of those elements, they, you know, sapphire, ceramic, and a good movement with a milled clasp and whatnot, you're either going to get an inferior movement in a King Turtle or you're going to be spending thousands in an LX model from Seiko, you know, four, five, six thousand dollars. So you just won't see value like this again. And it was produced in an era where Seiko did not do sapphire. They did not do ceramics. They did not do milled clasps. So it really was a unicorn that not a lot of collectors know about. And I miss mine definitely from time to time. Now, another piece that I regret moving on from is the Zenith Defy Classic 41 open work dial. I think this one is just as dynamic as you can get. The dial is so intricate and layered. 
and lovely. I just love everything about this. It had an unbeatable bracelet with incredible light play. You do a wrist roll and really the watch dazzles and you get lost in the details of the dial. It's a brand that is underrated. Zenith doesn't produce all that many watches per year when you compare it to brands like Breitling and Omega and certainly Rolex. So it is one that I miss, but probably not one that I will rebuy because I am partial to the stainless steel Defy Skyline that has come out and replaced the uh, the classic. So I don't know. I just think the Skyline matches the uh, the original vibe of the Defy that it is based on. I think it does a nicer job with that. I like the stainless steel. Unfortunately, I don't enjoy the open work dial variation. I don't think it is as visually strong as the previous gen that I let go of. So perhaps I'll buy one in the future, one of the Skylines, but I probably won't be getting the open work dial, which makes me miss this, you know, uh, one that I let go of even more. Now, another one that I have to fess up on is a Rolex. It is the 16570. I bought this Polar Explorer before it was all hyped up and hard to come by. So my version had solid end links. It had the engraved rehot. It had the newer movement. It really is a perfectly proportioned, thin, beautiful sports piece. And I think when I sold mine, uh, either back in 2015 or 2016, I, I think I got maybe 3,500 for that. And considering what they go for now, <laughs> I really uh, missed the boat on that. But honestly, I'm not in watches to make money. This is not my investment portfolio. So, you know, I tell myself that to lessen the sting of not maximizing on the right time to buy uh, or sell or trade. I, I lose money most of the time in this hobby. But again, I'm not in it for the money. I'm in it for the watches. I just should be improving my timing and my decision making. So let's move on to the next watch. I regret selling the Breitling Detora 42. This one, there's just no way around it. It is Breitling's coolest watch that I think they've made in the modern era. It is large. It is complicated. The dial is gorgeous. The details are crisp. I love the triple date moon phase paired with a chronograph in the salmon dial configuration. This is louder and larger and arguably more robust than the Patek Philippe variation that you are thinking of. So I just don't think I will ever get as cool of Breitling as the one that I let go of. And I think it really went up to the next level when I took it off the alligator and I put it on the Premier bracelet, the polished seven link bracelet with the taper. Ah, there was just not a weak part about that watch. If I had to nitpick, I think the clasp's a little bit dated. But other than that, that is Breitling perfection. Now, let me go to the last watch that I regret moving on from. And this one is the most embarrassing for myself. It is the Rolex Air King. So I bought one in 2016 and I completely trashed it on accident. It was beyond repair and it left such a sour taste in my mouth that I nearly quit watches. I nearly quit YouTube. I had to be talked back into the game. And so I, fortunately, I stuck with it. And I ended up rebuying one a few years later on my birthday. So I have my birthday on the warranty card, which no longer carries dates that you know are filled out by the authorized dealer. And I stupidly sold mine en route to a Vacheron Constantin overseas, which doesn't even crack my top 10 list of possible regrets. So I moved on from the Air King. I should not have moved on from that funky, quirky, crazy watch. Uh, I do plan on rebuying one at some point in the future, but I'm more interested in the current generation that is thinner, it's trimmer, it has a few tweaks on the dial. I just think it is amazing and it's not one of those models that's super hyped up. So I feel like it's my Rolex model. And certainly considering my embarrassing history, <laughs> the next one I get, I better not sell. So those are my uh, those are my regrets. Those are the watches that I definitely miss from time to time. But I will say, 
I don't walk around going, oh man, I missed this watch. I missed that watch. Because here's the thing about a flipper. We have such a short-term memory. We can look back with fondness on a number of different watches, but we live in the moment because there's always a piece on our wrist that has our attention and has our affection. So uh, you know what? Most of the time I go, oh man, I missed that watch. Oh, never mind. I'm wearing a day date. You know, as silly as that may sound. So, uh, yeah, I've made mistakes for the most part. I'm having a blast in this hobby. I will not change the way I go about enjoying this hobby, buying, trading, selling, trying, you know, just <laughs> going wherever I want, seemingly with little rhyme or reason. But I do hope to rebuy some of these models and, uh, you know, bring them back into the fold and not let them be forgotten. So, uh, you know, that's where I stand there. Tell me if you have watch regrets, if there are watches that you let go of, or perhaps had the opportunity to buy, but you never pulled the trigger. And now they're either unattainable or out of your price budget or whatever the case may be. I'd be curious to hear some of your more embarrassing regrets in the comment section. Now, lastly, again, if you are in the uh, Philadelphia area, Lancaster area, if you're uh, you know, within a reasonable driving distance, I would love to meet you. So uh, let's talk watches. Let's hang out. Links in the description of the video. Have a good one. I'll see you next time.